Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Bryce Duskin. On this episode, Elaine Cub discusses corn and soybean markets, Andrea Durkin addresses how farmers should prepare for the steel and aluminum tariffs. Tara Hartman talks about her UNL research on bacteria leaf streak. And Brian Keel discusses how Farmers for Free Trade gives a voice to farmers. Elaine Cub, author of Mastering the Grain Markets, is our market analyst this week. Last week, the U.S. Department of Agriculture released the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates for the month of March. In the report, USDA raised Brazil's expected soybean crop to a total of 4.15 billion bushels. Argentina's crop was lowered to 1.7 billion bushels due to the continued drought. Pressure continues to mount domestically as the president solidifies his plan to impose new tariffs on steel and aluminum. Currently, agriculture leaders are warning of a possible trade war with export countries like China. Meanwhile, a lack of measurable precipitation in parts of the southern plains increases concerns of a poor wheat crop. We talked with Elaine on Wednesday afternoon and began by asking her how the markets reacted to last week's report. Well, going into that, the big question was how well USDA would estimate the Argentina soybean crop, because that has been the big story that has been fueling a rally in soybean prices in the last couple of months. And USDA came in and they said the Argentine soybean crop would be 47 million metric tons, and that's a smaller number than most of the traders were expecting going into the report. So they, that would be interpreted as a bullish surprise. Uh, I'd like to mention that it could get adjusted even, even lower as time goes on, because right now Argentina soybean fields are still, they still need moisture to fill those pods, and they're not getting that moisture in the forecast. So it is possible for that number to get lower, and some private estimators have, have suggested that the, the final number for Argentina will be lower than 47 million metric tons. Talk about the markets. Did they react to that bullish number? They reacted right away, and you know they, they do this a lot on report day. They 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 bounced up right away after the report, but then they've been moving lower ever since. Even that day, they closed lower, and they've kind of been trending lower ever since. And that is um, that's something that they do. You know, you buy the rumor, sell the fact. That has been the story in the past, but now the idea of a short so Argentine soybean crop may be fully priced into the markets, and the markets now see this opportunity to correct or to take their profits or to sell off. Uh, now that that story is fully priced in. Let's talk uh, about Argentina, Brazil weather one more time here. How much longer can we expect the markets to be reacting to that weather? Oh, you know, so Brazil is about 50% harvested at the moment, and Argentina is just starting to get to get their harvest started. Uh, so there still is a few weeks here where you are going to need uh, precipitation in Argentina to fill those pods. And certainly they're very spooky about the idea that the rally is over. They had built up 17 times as many long positions as short positions, and I'm talking about those funds, those managed money speculative funds. So now I think they see any opportunity to get out of soybeans, and, and this is this is their chance. Well, let's talk more about domestically. Soybeans have fell 50 cents since the beginning of March, and that's largely due to tariff talks. Talk about the retaliation that uh, there's talk of China retaliating and the big concerns that traders are having. Yeah, like I mentioned, anything that spooks these traders that were previously long in soybeans will definitely, uh, you know, cause that long liquidation and I think that's why we're seeing these volatile days with these big double digit losses in soybeans. And certainly our soybean exports are very vulnerable to the idea of a trade war. Our soybean exports and our pork exports, our beef exports, meat in general, that's that's some that's another place that China could come in and retaliate. That's a very vulnerable area from our export perspective. 
um, from soybeans, China will probably have to buy some soybeans from America eventually. They, they probably can't get by with what else is out there available on the world market. But I think they will certainly prefer trading partners like Brazil, who does not have an antagonistic relationship or is not in the process of building an antagonistic trade relationship with them. So certainly that has been something that has spooked the soybean market, yes. What trends do you see as we continue to move through March for fellow row crop commodities? Well, this is a time of year when seasonally we do tend to see the high, the, that, that seasonal high, this, this late February, sort of early March high, that seems to have been placed. Certainly in the soybean market, our best opportunities were probably a week or so behind us. But the prices are still profitable. This is still a, certainly a good time for farmers to be looking at making some sales and locking in some profitable prices. At 1030 futures, soybeans are definitely a profitable crop for folks to be locking in with what they intend to plant in 2018. Talk about the drought happening in Kansas and Oklahoma and the Southern Plains as a whole. Can we see that? It's currently affecting wheat. Will it spill over to the other commodities? Well, the drought may spill over to other commodities, and that would certainly be something that is bears watching when we get into May-June timeframe. Right now, though, for the markets, we've seen that KC wheat contract, which reflects the hard red winter wheat market, certainly has been rallying, and that's justified. We've seen NAS come in and say that a majority of the Kansas and Texas wheat fields are rated either poor or very poor, and as they come out of dormancy, it is not looking great down there. But that supply problem, that's really not something that has even spilled over into hard red spring wheat yet, and it certainly hasn't spilled over into the feed wheat sector yet. So the supply losses potential from that Southern Plains drought, that so far is not a problem for the other markets. But if the drought itself persists and expands and gets farther into the Corn Belt, if it starts affecting Nebraska in a bigger way, then yes, that's absolutely something that, that could come in and, and spark some sort of the summer rally for corn and soybeans. Next week, Doug Simon from Tradeoffs will join us to provide his analysis of the corn and soybean markets. As talk of tariffs and renegotiation of trade agreements continues to cause volatility across the commodity markets, this week at a Hearman lecture, the importance of trade in rural America and beyond was discussed. The lecture featured a panel discussion focused on tools that allow producers and consumers to advocate for trade. According to Andrea Durkin, one of the panelists and editor-in-chief of Trade Vistas, Americans appreciate the benefits of free trade, but don't always attribute those benefits to free trade. Andrea is also concerned about tariffs imposed on imported steel and aluminum. She fears these tariffs can cause other countries to impose their own retaliatory tariffs. We spoke with Andrea ahead of the panel discussion on Tuesday. So one of the greatest opportunities for U.S. farmers is to export their products. And particularly when it comes to perishable goods, um, perishable foods, you're talking about high quality meats, you're talking about fruits and vegetables. As developing countries grow and people uh, acquire more income, there is this evolution that takes place in nutritional requirements, but also the having the wherewithal to buy um, higher quality produce and, and meats. And the demand is there and it's particularly growing fast in developing countries, in India, in China, but also in, in Africa. And these are our export markets. Um, and so it's incredibly important that we make sure that um, they have a robust regulatory system so that we don't have problems um, exporting and meeting those requirements or that the requirements aren't um, inconsistent with an international approach to standards. Um, but also there's a tremendous need for improving the mechanics at the border. You know, if perishable foods sit at the border for too long or they're sitting in a warehouse where the conditions aren't right, that's money that our exporters are losing every day. And of course, and from a food security perspective, it's not good for um, the citizens of that country that are trying to import the food. So there's a lot of opportunity, but we have to invest to make sure that governments um, improve their processes at the border. Improving the mechanics at the border impacts the process of exports along with adding tariffs to specific items. We asked Andrea to give her perspective on how the steel and aluminum tariffs will impact agricultural exports. The steel and aluminum tariffs is a great example of the incredible interconnectivity um, among products these days and services. So uh, you, can, you can't just look at it as a narrow um, action that may have that may have a benefit for steel and aluminum, and it may not. Actually, the the genesis of this whole thing 
um, is that the producers are, the steel producers and aluminum producers are worried about global price because the price is driven down when there's overproduction in the world and much of that is being driven um, not just in China but certainly in China. Um, unfortunately, the tariffs don't get at that question at all. Um, and they also, the administration is using a tool um, claiming that it's in the interest of national security. Well, the national security provisions are self-judging. So let's say, for example, in this case, uh, we're concerned about what steel goes into from a security perspective. Maybe we're thinking about defense machinery, not agriculture machinery. Um, well, what would stop another country from taking a definition about food security that is related to national security and therefore putting up barriers on agricultural products in the name of national security? So there's that aspect to it. Um, with the tariffs, that means that any good that uses steel or aluminum, the price is necessarily going to go up, even if we're not buying imported goods or we're substituting them for domestic. What happens is that the domestic producers now have license to basically increase their own prices by the amount of the tariff, which they typically do. So anybody who is using a product like a tractor that is incorporating steel or aluminum is probably going to face an increase in prices. So there's another aspect to this, which is that um, other countries, steel producing countries like Europe, uh, there's the history of this is that when we've applied tariffs on steel and aluminum in a case like this, they will take retaliatory action. It may come in the form of safeguards on their own products. Maybe they raise tariffs on steel coming into their countries. But equally, they can apply tariffs to totally unrelated products. And agriculture is almost always on that list of goods that they retaliate against. Why? Because it hurts our producers. And if you want us to take a change to our policy to, to eliminate those tariffs on steel and aluminum, you're going to find where um, there's maximum hurt to the U.S. economy, and that unfortunately would include agriculture producers. So what should producers do to prepare themselves for these modifications in global exports? Number one, they get educated about it because um, it will have a ripple effect in the economy. It will affect their business in some way. Um, so we have a website called Trade Vistas. Uh, tradevistas.csis.org. It's one resource. We try to curate and summarize articles that you may hear and put it in short form. Um, that's one thing, is to get educated about the potential impact to your business. Um, and the second would be to become active in telling your representatives that you're concerned about the potential impact to your business. Um, it's not true anymore that you can take some action to ostensibly protect one part of the economy and not have it affect another part of the economy. So it's really important that our policymakers hear the voices of farmers. As mentioned, Andrea Durkin is the editor-in-chief of Trade Vistas. To learn more about trade, you can visit the Trade Vistas website at tradevistas.csis.org. We not only spoke with Andrea Durkin at the Hearman Lecture, but we also sat down with Brian Keel. According to Brian Keel, Executive Director of Farmers for Free Trade, 20% of farm revenue comes from farm exports. Farmers for Free Trade is an organization that allows for farmers to have a voice in supporting free trade. The nonprofit organization has online tools that allow farmers to communicate on why free trade is important to their operation. Farmers for Free Trade is a bipartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to helping farmers give their voice in support of free trade. Uh, we were founded last year with the support of the American Farm Bureau Federation, National Corn Growers Association, uh, National Pork Producers Council, and many other ag organizations really to help coordinate between ag organizations and with farmers across the country speaking out in support of free trade. According to Brian, Farmers for Free Trade is working on reaching out to their audience through multiple marketing ways. Farmers for Free Trade has been doing a lot of activities around the country to try to build support for trade. Uh, we've been going out talking with farmers at ag conventions distributing uh, these ridiculously large buttons in support of free trade, which actually Governor Ricketts wore one last night, and we were very pleased with that. Uh, we've been giving out bumper stickers that say, I'm a farmer for free trade, and we've been having people sign banners that say, I'm a farmer for free trade. All ways, very simple ways, that farmers can show their support for trade. So, why should farmers support this organization? According to Brian, 20% of the farm revenue comes from ag exports. So when you think about that, if we're not shipping our products overseas, 
we're getting nowhere as an industry. Think about it this way. There are a lot more mouths outside the United States than there are inside the United States, and we grow food, or we grow feed that, that goes into animals. It's critically important that we're able to ship that food and that those commodities outside the U.S. To further inform producers about the importance of trade, Farmers for Free Trade just launched their Voice of the Farmer campaign. One of the things Farmers for Free Trade is doing is today we are launching uh, our Voice of the Farmer campaign, which is an exciting campaign. We have uh, radio and television spots going up nationwide talking about the importance of trade to U.S. agriculture. Those spots feature a fourth generation farmer from Montana talking about her grain and her uh, livestock and, and where they're exported. Um, and we're also giving farmers an opportunity to engage directly in this topic. So if farmers go to farmersforfreetrade.com, they can film their own short 30 second video talking about where they're from, what they grow, and why trade's important to them. Those little video snippets then we'll put up on social media, we'll share with elected officials, we'll just really use to build a drumbeat of support uh, in U.S. agriculture for trade. We also asked Brian where producers can find more information about Farmers for Free Trade. Farmers can go to farmersforfreetrade.com. We also have a Give $20 for Trade campaign. Uh, so if you want to make a small donation to support our efforts, we'll use that money to put the message out on ag radio that trade is important. Uh, so important for Nebraska, so important for America. Uh, so really encourage people to support Farmers for Free, tr for free Trade. Next week, Kirsten Hillman, Deputy Ambassador for Canada, will give us an update on NAFTA discussions. About 500,000 acres were planted to dicamba tolerant soybeans in 2017. However, Nebraska Extension received complaint reports on about 350 dicamba off-target related injuries on more than 50,000 acres of non-DT soybeans. At recent crop production clinics, Nebraska Extension professionals discussed how producers cannot look at dicamba in the same way as glyphosate. You can read more about 2018 expectations on dicamba in the March Nebraska Farmer. A survey sponsored by the Nebraska Corn Board confirmed that bacterial leaf streak was present in at least 60 Nebraska counties. According to Tara Hartman, a UNL graduate research assistant, bacterial leaf streak was not present in the state or country until 2016. The pathogen is favored by warm, humid conditions and is thought to be spread by wind-driven rain. We spoke with Tara earlier this week and began our conversation by asking her what causes this disease. Well, bacterial leaf streak is caused by the bacterial pathogen Xanthomonas vesicola pathovar vasculorum. This pathogen had only been reported in South Africa until 2016 when it was reported on corn in Nebraska causing disease. And so because it had only been reported in South Africa, we weren't sure about the distribution uh, in the whole United States, but especially in Nebraska. And so in order to kind of uh, investigate this question, we conducted a survey in 2016 and 2017, which mainly focused on Nebraska, but also kind of spilled over into some other states. In addition to the survey, we've also done some host range research. So we knew that this pathogen was able to cause disease on a wide range of plants, um, everything from, of course, corn to sorghum, sugarcane, and even palm and bamboo species. And so because it had such a wide host range, there was some concern that it might also cause disease on other plants that are found in Nebraska, like crops or weeds or native grasses. And so we looked into that as well. In order to know if these plants contained the disease, we asked Tara what the bacterial leaf streak symptoms were. So the symptoms include uh, streaks that are in between the veins on the corn. And these streaks will have uh, wavy margins as opposed to ones that are perfectly linear. And these streaks will usually appear yellow when backlit as well. As Tara noted, not only can this disease be found on corn, but also on weeds and native grasses. During her UNL research, Tara was able to test a few of these plant species. So we've tested about 34 different species of weeds, other crops that may appear in a rotation with corn, and also native prairie grasses that are commonly found in Nebraska. The ones that we found that were symptomatic included rice, oats, bristly foxtail, green foxtail, yellow nut sedge, big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, orchard grass, and timothy. For corn, the bacterial leaf streak infection occurs during different growing stages depending on where the research is conducted. In greenhouse studies, we've tried to inoculate as soon as the corn emerged at VE, or also known as spike stage. 
And so we were able to get infection at that stage in the greenhouse. The earliest we've seen infection in the field is on V4 corn. Tara then explained how certain environmental conditions can help increase a bacterial leaf streak infection. Environmental conditions that improve the chance of infection include uh, warm and wet, humid environments. The wetness on the leaf favors the pathogen and also a wind-driven rain. The rain can uh, force the bacteria down into the stomata of the leaf, which creates good opportunity for the bacteria to get in and establish an infection. In the greenhouse, that's kind of an artificial environment. And so we sprayed it down with an inoculum load and then uh, we put the plants in a perfect environment for disease development. And so that's not going to happen in a field very often. So what we've actually done is taken the plants that were symptomatic, that got infected, and we transplanted them out into a field. And we didn't inoculate them, just let them grow among diseased corn plants. And we monitored them for symptoms. And uh, we didn't get quite as much disease in the field as we saw in the greenhouse, but we did get disease on a big blue stem and bristly foxtail. And so while it's not very likely that this will happen in a realistic environment, it certainly can at very low levels, obviously. According to Tara, this disease might be difficult to manage. There's not a lot that farmers can really do to manage it as of right now. There are some typical uh, mitigation strategies for bacterial residue-borne diseases, including crop rotation and tillage. Some farmers could try bactericides, but those are just contact, uh, not systemic chemicals. And so uh, they'll usually require multiple applications, which will typically not be an economical thing for a farmer to do. And uh, there's no resistant hybrids as of right now. And so basically, if this is a problem for a farmer, their best bet is to do mitigation strategies like crop rotation and tillage. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we again for the weekly forecast and during this last seven days we dealt with a pending storm system that moved through the region last weekend. Brought a mixture of freezing rain, rain and snow to the state. The more significant accumulations in the northern portion of the state, particularly northeast Nebraska. Some of the more significant ice accumulations across portions of east central southeast Nebraska. And we've seen that general warming trend during the middle of the week. We finally busted the 70 degree mark across a lot of south central southwest Nebraska and upper 60s across portions of southeast Nebraska. Per really nice warm weather that eastern Nebraska has seen in quite a while. And then we've seen this general cool down with that storm coming out of the western United States in pieces. The first piece of energy came out on Thursday, brought some inclement weather to the northern part of the state in the form of accumulating snowfall in the northwest and a mixture of snow, freezing rain, and rain mix as you got into southeastern Nebraska. Now we got a little respite before the next system pulls through later this weekend and before we get to that main model forecast, I wanted to bring you up to date on the latest seasonal forecast and monthly forecast. So as we go to the maps, the one thing we will draw your attention to on the monthly forecast preliminarily is, is that cold conditions across the northern plains looks like it's going to continue. Nebraska sits right in that EC zone, making equal chances. And as we go to the south, of course, dealing with the above normal temperatures. That's been a predominant fa uh, feature this entire winter. In terms of precipitation, do show most of the Dakotas showing above normal moisture as well as the eastern Corn Belt. So we should see some additional relief for the drought areas and the long-term drought areas of the Dakotas. Unfortunately, this drier than normal trend does not point well to the extreme southern Rockies where we're dealing with some low snowpack levels. We'll take out the three month forecast, this takes us through the months of April, May, and June, so the first real warm month of our growing season. And we see above normal temperatures included all of the southern half of the Rockies, which is a small area of above no or below normal temperatures in the northern Rockies. In terms of precipitation, once again, widespread above normal moisture across the Great Lakes and well below normal moisture from Texas northwest into southern Oregon. So this would include most of the central and southern Rockies regions and this would be on the very southern extreme of the area that feeds the Platte River Basin. We do not want to see this verify. We need to see some additional moisture in the Rocky Mountains to feel comfortable going into this growing season that we can keep that drought confined to the southern plains. So as we look into this next 24 hour period, of course, we've got this big storm that's coming on shore just like we seen last weekend. And the first piece of energy moved out, 
caught up with the trough over the eastern United States and that system kind of petered out, but the next piece of energy will be coming out. We do have surface lows showing up along the front range of the Rocky Mountains. We don't have any moisture with us. All the moisture is with the upper level support to the west and a little bit of that moisture residual left over in the eastern Corn Belt from the system that passed through the, earlier this week. Now, that trough deepens, surface low well to the north of it. That's going to pull a lot of moisture up and around this low pressure system at the surface. So we should see some fairly wide precipitation breaking out across the region. We do see some moisture showing for the southern Rockies. It doesn't look that impressive. And then this storm system moves into the southeastern United States. Heavy precipitation and that wraparound will actually produce some pretty significant moisture across portions of eastern Nebraska with potential snow accumulations as it emerges in with that colder air mass. We'll see that rainfall make it to the surface and then that system will start to move its way to the eastern United States on Tuesday. We will start to see a ridging pattern build back in. Not as warm as last week, but certainly we will see a warming trend during the middle part of the week. A little bit of light snow up in the Dakotas possible, but the heavy precipitation along the eastern seaboard and that will be the next northeastern storm as we get into Wednesday and Thursday. This big trough will project a low at the surface up the eastern seaboard and once again we are leading with another significant snow maker in this region. High and dry the center part of the country. Yet another system looks like it's going to come on board on Wednesday and Thursday in the western United States and some of that energy will start to make its way toward the southern plains particularly as we get into late Thursday with surface low pressure indicated over southeastern Colorado but the most heaviest precipitation still remains confined to the western United States. We get into Friday, that trough starts to lift toward the northeast, so it's going to miss the southern plains unfortunately. Low pressure will direct that energy up toward the Dakotas and that's where we will see the more significant moisture as it's pulled a long way. The heaviest precipitation northeast Nebraska and points to the north. Now as we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast from next Thursday through the following Tuesday, cool conditions across the northern half of the country, warm to the south in terms of precipitation well above normal moisture across the vast majority of the United States. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on soybean markets, the importance of free trade, and UNL research on bacterial leaf streak. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Next week, Doug Simon from Tradeoffs will be our market analyst, and Jim Jansen will be discussing the 2018 Nebraska Farm Real Estate Market Survey. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Bryce Duskett. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.